Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started soon, but just in the meantime, a reminder that you should scan that QR code and get in the Meet Echo system so you can put yourself in the queue. Um, also a reminder to wear a mask. And just give us a minute while we set up. Um, downstairs at the registration, but, um, I can go. I'm just going to notif notify, I don't know, Meet Echo, but we, some of the slides we had uploaded are not yet visible. I'm not really sure how to refresh that, but we've got a few minutes before that's an issue. Hmm? Well, I don't, I don't actually know if I can refresh it. Oh. Okay, I see it now. Cool, thanks. It's so funny because this shows it, but when I go to share preloaded slides, it doesn't show it. That's probably fine. See, there are only these three. Isn't that strange? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm just speaking to the Meet Echo folks. We've got the slides um, that we need in the uh, materials list, but then when I go to share them, Dex Ready to be Shared only has three of the five, or yeah, three of the five. We've just had an, a recent upload in the last few minutes, but um, yeah, let's see. There's a difference between Data Tracker Meeting Materials and Dex Ready to be Shared. Colin's fixing everything right now. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Got it. That is fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we're back on track, folks. We're going to get started. Um, and really, the um, I just need to get out of this window. <laughs> okay. Um, we're all set. I'm just going to pull up chair slides, <clears throat> and we'll go ahead. So this is the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group. Um, this is a two-hour session. We have uh, two invited talks and um, some pre-loaded AOB. Um, and so this is our agenda. Do folks have comments on this agenda at all? Would you like to add yourself to the AOB? Actually, this is not accurate. We do have another update on a, on a draft. So Sophia isn't here, but I know she wants to be on the agenda later for some of her work. Other things? All right. Um, so in, um, in that vein, I'll also just remind folks that this is being recorded. 
I'll again remind you to scan the QR code so that you can get into the Meet ecosystem, put yourself on the queue when there's time for questions and discussion. And also my last um, order of business at the beginning is to ask if anybody would mind taking notes during the discussion. This will be not capturing the talks, but rather capturing the discussion after the talks and discussion about our drafts. Can I get a volunteer? Thank you. Thanks very much, Michaela. Appreciate you. All right. So just in um, the introduction, I have to also remind you of the note well. You've maybe seen this a lot, but for those of you that have just come today, it's important that you disclose any intellectual property interests when you're speaking at the IETF and the IRTF. Um, we also have a privacy and code of conduct in our note well. That's really important. If you haven't read that or aren't familiar with it, you should re-familiarize yourself. Um, and so also, I wanted to remind us of the goals of the IRTF because this research group is within that. So we're focusing on the long-term issues. Specifically, this research group is looking at the human rights considerations of um, internet protocols and the standardization of those. Um, and we aren't setting standards. Uh, we really are um, publishing informational or experimental documents. Um, but a lot of it is just discussion and talks, which I think is a really valuable uh, contribution to the community. And so we're chartered to research specifically um, how internet protocols could both strengthen or threaten human rights. And we use there are two main documents that we rely on to define human rights. That's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and then that's also the International Civil and Political Rights Convention. We've continuously begun, like, discussed um, two rights for the most part. It's um, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Privacy is, of course, also a human right, but that is in a different research group. Siobhan is in the room. He knows there's plenty of overlap between our research groups. That's a good thing. And then I think also another wonderful thing about our objectives is we bring folks first in human rights into this space to also hope that there's pollination, cross-pollination in the other direction where they become also more familiar with the technical community and the inner workings of the IETF. We do have some drafts. We're going to go over them. We have some published RFCs. Um, there are other outputs, I think, that are less easy to quantify, but tend to be around sharing information, publishing blogs, that sort of thing. But you really have to sort of follow the folks of us that have been busy in this group for a long time. I'm wondering if Aubrey's in the room. I see Aubrey online. She's not here was a previous co-chair of this and, and does a lot of that as well. Um, so work to date, um, we, you know, we've been chartered since 2015. Um, there's a film online that you can check out. Um, and then we've had our major work published, RFC 8280, which is really lays out all of the human rights considerations. Um, and we're currently working on a document that's near publication. Well, it's, in, it's further in the publication queue um, each and every meeting uh, that sort of takes 8280 and distills it down into a sort of more bite-sized work. I would also say that the work to date, I'm including all the talks, the invited talks we've had, the meetings we've held. We've held approximately 23 meetings, which is quite a few at this point. Um, and I'm just approximating because I haven't actually counted, but we've, we usually have about two sometimes three talks per meeting. So we've had 50 invited talks on a variety of different topics. Um, there's a lot of discussion about censorship, which is gonna be a, um, one that we will hear about today. Um, privacy and encryption, various forms of digital security measures um, or considerations for groups that are at risk and most marginalized. Um, variety of emerging technologies, including blockchain-based things and um, environmental sustainability. There's probably things I'm missing, but I just tried to off the cuff remind, like remember what we've talked about in the past. We have two current drafts. 
Um, we'll hear about both of them today, the updates on those. They've both progressed since the 114 meeting in Philadelphia. This is what I mentioned before. The Guidelines for Human Rights Protocol Considerations is a companion document to RFC 8280. And then we have a, um, a specific draft on free association. Um, and then this is for later. So we'll get back to these slides. I'm going to first have us pause. There's an important um, piece of the agenda right now. I'm going to ask Tara to come on if you can to explain the context here. But this is a sort of last minute addition to our agenda that we're putting at the front because I think it's an important reminder for folks um, in this space. So Tara, I'm just going to hand the mic to you at this point. Thank you, Mallory. Um... Yeah, and thank you for um, holding this space to talk about uh, Allah and his, and his fight for freedom. Um, Allah Abdel Fattah, in his own words, first and foremost, was a, is a free and open source developer. He's a port, he was an important part of our technical community. He's also a writer, a tireless uh, advocate and activist for people's rights. And for also for many, he was one of the symbols of the 2011 Egyptian revolution. Um, last but not least, he's a beloved colleague, friend and member to many, and a loving father to his son Khalid, who has been deprived from him as he spent most of the nine, last nine years as a prisoner of conscience. Allah is a special person, but his situation unfortunately is far from special. Thousands of people languish in Egyptian prisons unfairly with no access to lawyers, tried under martial courts and trumped up charges, many just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Tens more are dying because of terrible conditions in these prisons. In fact, Allah's crime was sharing a social media post about one of those stories. Furthermore, his lawyer was also arrested when he went to attend one of Allah's interrogations. Allah was tried under a state security court, which is a martial court. While that was the official reason Allah is in prison, Allah is also being punished for who he is, as a symbol for many and for being someone who always advocates for justice, even when it's not convenient, easy, or popular. Um, I think as a way in order to deter others from standing up to tyranny and in a way to teach him a lesson. Allah is also a father and a friend who has paid a big price for his activism the past nine years with almost no sign of improvement or recourse to justice uh, Allah went on a limited hung, limited calorie strike earlier this year and escalated to a full hunger strike at the beginning of the COP27 UN Climate uh, Forum at the beginning of this week. Allah did this because he wants to live with his family, friends, and his son, and also because if he were to become a symbol or a lesson, he wanted to do it on his own terms and teach the lesson he wants to teach. Um, in many ways, Allah has already won his fight. He exposed the tyranny and injustice he and thousands of others are, are facing by the Egyptian government and helped share their stories uh, of the thousands in prisons on a global platform. He highlighted the empty platitudes of our world leaders and their timidness to take any action, let alone on climate change. He also mobilized and gave hope, energy, and urgency to hundreds and thousands of people who share his desire for a better world, unlocking new avenues of solidarity and global mobilization all from his prison cell, and highlighted the importance of the human rights as a cornerstone of human progress. Allah is doing what Allah does best. He's fighting to save us with all the means at his disposal. What remains to be seen is what price he has to pay and whether we can save him back, to give him a chance at living his life again. We have heard no news from him since he went on his full hunger strike. The Egyptian government is not giving access to his lawyers, or um, his legal counsel, his, his consular access, since he's also a British uh, citizen, and we have not heard any news. The only news we've heard is that there's a fear that he's currently being force fed, which is considered a form of torture. At this stage, I would have loved to have like a call of action for you of any sort in order to help um, ask for your help in, in Nala's struggle for freedom. But unfortunately, like, the options seem very limited at this stage. I would ask maybe that you uh, look for the Freedom for Allah page on Twitter or and follow like whatever 
actions they propose there at the moment. Um, in the meantime, I thought the best way to um, the best way to celebrate Allah at this point was to share some of his words, because I think, like, as someone who is really passionate for technology, uh, new technology, and as someone who's also equally passionate about human rights, he would have appreciated the work of this group and would love to have critically engaged with it. So I'm sharing some of the words that he wrote that might be relevant to the work of, of this group that I found. Um, in this article written in 2016, Ala was reflecting on um, platform economy and platforms like Uber and how they affect people's rights. Um, and he was reflecting on it from his place in, in the prison cell, not having access to uh, news on demand and just whatever he could uh, read or hear from magazines that were available to him. Um, Allah, Allah says, uh, seeing as I stand accused of casting doubt on official narratives and being an inverted, an advertent offender when it comes to challenging hegemonic ideas, I find myself instinctively, intrinsically doubting this account of disruptive technologies. This is despite my usual enthusiasm for modernization, advancement in technology, information technology most of all, and despite the many benefits these services, networks, and technologies offer me. It may be true that the Industrial Revolution brought widespread affluence, but the painful convolutions that accompanied it were by no means quick to subside, and it was generations before things settled. Neither the Luddites, nor their children, nor even their grandchildren reaped the fruits of the Industrial Revolution. And what relative prosperity it brought was not the result of technology alone, but of the interplay between technological innovation and political reform. The period saw the regularization of the work hours, the prohibition of child labor, the establishment of industrial safety regulations, the introduction of the minimum wage, the negotiation of wages through collective bargaining, the introduction of regular statutory holidays, and an acceptance of the idea that health and education as rights to be granted in the form of public services funded via taxation from the profits of the Industrial Revolution's beneficiaries, along with many other rights and protections afforded to wage liberals that we take for granted today. It is these same rights and protections which the Fourth Industrial Revolution is threatening. If industrialized societies had continued to allow factory owners to employ children for long hours in inhumane conditions or failed to introduce progressive taxation based on profit, as was the case early in the Industrial Revolution, it would not be possible today to consider Luddite as a synonym for stupidity and backwardness. Most importantly, the process of transformation was a path of bitter conflict between different classes and interests. Labor rights were vested by force from states, governments, and factory workers after decades of protests, struggles, and revolution. Yes, the Luddites were defeated, but in their place came working class fighters and activists who did not reject progress, but sought to impose their own terms on the course it would take. Elites and ruling classes treated them with the same violence and derision meted out to the Luddites, but the resistance continued, and sometimes protests were so heated that the workers sabotaged machinery. The difference, of course, being that where the Luddites' sole design was to sabotage machinery, the workers saw sabotage as a mean to exert pressure, which was rapidly replaced as unionization and industrial action became legal rights designed to take the place of violence and counterviolence. To characterize the historical process brought about by the Industrial Revolution as temporary birthing pains that gave away to affluence and ease, not only obscures the details of the class conflict within the major industrial nations, but also the differing ways nations experience those transnational transitional pains. The Industrial Revolution brought about colonial expansion and increasing colonial violence as industrialized nations opened new markets and sought new raw materials and savage competition between industrialized nations over the fruits of modernization, which resulted in the outbreak of world wars. In short, the invention of new technologies may be a given, but their growth and dissemination and the structure of the markets and power relations which are based upon them are far from it. They are the results of political changes which are in turn the outcome of conflicts within society. Understanding technological innovations, analyzing their effect, and cultivating a healthy skepticism of the propagandistic narratives which necessarily accompany them is vital. Fighting these technologies in the interest behind them with the aim of directing their course, curbing the harms they cause, and expanding their benefits, increasing the number of people they help, and compensating those they harm is therefore also vital. 
The only people more stupid than those who stand in the way of history are those who prostrate themselves before it. They leave no trace or memory at all, even as a cautionary tale to the Luddites. Um, that will be, that's all I have for you today. Um, please, um, in any way, if you can, if you can, I don't know, talk to people, uh, let them know more about the case, help. Um, we just want to know what's happening um, to our friend and colleague, um, whether he's still alive, whether he's still, um, whether he's being force fed. And we also want him to get out safely. And um, I'll leave you with his words. You have not been defeated. You have not yet been defeated. Thank you, Tara. Um, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, we won't uh, take questions right now, um, but thank you, Abdus Salam, for getting in the queue. Um, you can feel free to express in the chat if you uh, had a question or so on, but we will now move on to Dimitri's talk. Um, so co come on up, Dimitri. I've got your slides and you can use this pointer, um, but stand on the pink X. Um, yeah. It'll just take a second because I don't see your slides. And I don't. Yeah, the slides are loading. I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, it's a very difficult uh, presentation to follow. In the mic, Sorry, um, speak, so you have to speak right into the yeah, microphone. Sorry, plus the, plus the mask doesn't help. I, I remember um, working with Allah in early 2000s on an Arabic translation of a digital security reference manual we were building. And uh, it's been difficult to follow this unfortunate progress. So I do hope that if you have any means, you know, via social media or via physical contact with relevant participants here at the conference, that you do bring up the case as strongly as possible. All right, to the presentation then, just testing the clicker and I'll come back. Right. Okay. I just had a recent COVID test, so don't worry. Uh, how do I go through the slides, or do I just ask you? All right. So my name is Dmitry Vitaliev. I'm the founding director of a digital security firm out of Montreal uh, called Equality. Uh, we've been operational for about 13 years now. I've been working in the space of digital security solutions for the protection and promotion of human rights for about 20 years. The name Equality assumes that this is what we want to bring to the internet. We want to kind of equal out the playing field between the users and very often the victims of this network and the powers that be, you know, the corporations, the governments uh, that in large part have built and controlled this network. We focus on web security, capacity building, censorship resistance. I'm going to be talking to you about our work on uh, web security and censorship resistance um, today. And uh, I think to mention right off the bat that all of the solutions that we develop are released free and open source. And you can find them on GitHub as well. Thank you. Next slide. All right, I'll mention briefly four of our projects today. Um, a website security infrastructure, Deflect, a machine learning framework that is operating inside this infrastructure in order to help us uh, mitigate malicious requests sent to our clients a censorship circumvention system we have built called Sino, and an emergency communications uh, project uh, we have stood up in Ukraine since the beginning of the war there uh, that is basically helping people communicate with each other when internet connectivity is not present. I think uh, by and large all of our technologies are built in defense of freedom of expression and association online. Thank you, Mallory. Next slide. All right, so since 2011, the Deflect project 
uh, has protected numerous uh, independent media, human rights group, democracy movements uh, from various cyber attacks. Now, these can be the sort of run of the mill cyber attacks, you know, which everybody faces when they're being online, all the way up to very well coordinated and quite massive um, cyber attacks with, uh, you know, uh, sometimes evident state adversaries behind them. And we've been doing this, yeah, for 12 years now. So the Deflect Network kind of offers four Ps to its clients. Obviously, protection um, and performance. It is really a reverse proxy caching network with quite a lot of load balancing and intelligence and elasticity built into the network. By virtue of you know being in many locations around the world and doing caching, you know it also kind of speeds up the delivery of our clients' web pages to their readers. In difference to many other uh, efforts out there, this is a network and a team that is very much defined by its principles. We don't work with simply any website out there. We have criteria for the type of content our clients may not present on their websites, including incitement to violence, hate speech, so on and so forth. And we define the processes for how we go about resolving various abuse complaints that come in, and they do come in quite often, some of them legitimate, some of them social engineering. And by and large, this is a philanthropic service. It has a commercial arm, it has a nonprofit arm. Uh, all profits you know, derived from offering the commercial service are channeled into supporting uh, and offering a free service to various civil society out there. Next slide, please. So yeah, just briefly how it's built. Um, as I mentioned before, reverse proxy caching. Uh, clients point the DNS to the deflect infrastructure. Uh, we make sure various requests are distributed across our service in about 25 different data centers now. And within the infrastructure itself, uh, clients are obviously offered caching, human support in about six different languages. Uh, various analytics on the traffic, both malicious and legitimate, coming at their web presence. Uh, it also offers secure hosting uh, for websites developing the WordPress framework and uh, machine learning and bot detection, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Being an open source infrastructure, we encourage third parties to stand up their own versions of the flat, and they can call it whatever they like, really. Uh, this is 12 years of work packaged into an easily provisionable and managed architecture um, that, you know, probably cost tens of millions of dollars to rebuild from scratch. So go and get it. It's free. Next slide. About a million people come through our network every day. About 75 million unique IPs are served on an annual basis. It's around 2% of people connected to the internet. Um, and yeah, quite a lot of experience mitigating various attacks. Next slide. These are some of the attacks uh, that Deflect protects its clients from. Uh, possibly none of these are new to you. Uh, we are layer seven uh, defenses primarily. Uh, we also protect our clients from quite a few legal attacks, uh, which happen, uh, you know, often enough, several times a month, you know, we're getting quasi-legitimate, legitimate to completely false and erroneous uh, legal attacks. By and large, uh, without a sort of an experienced partner protecting a website, you know, an invalid DMCA takedown request just works even if there's no DMCA content, you know, that they're complaining about. So we're also there to help with that. Next slide. Now, in order to get <laughs> evenings and weekends off, you know, we've had to develop quite a lot of technology to help us mitigate these attacks, particularly we also delved into the whole world of machine-led mitigation, you know, trying to figure out how we can train uh, a model to differentiate between legitimate and malicious requests. After three years of um, R&D and a lot of uh, uh, wrong turns and directions, uh, we finally found the approach that has become Buskevel. So we've basically 
train the model on recognizing what is human behavior and thereafter looking at algorithmic machine-led behavior as anomalies. This is an infrastructure called Buskeville. And I think one of the main advantages to it, it for us and for anybody else who adopts this kind of framework on their own ends is that a lot of the pre-processing uh, happens at the network edge and only you know, vector features are being communicated to the clearinghouse. So this is what we believe is a sort of a private by design system. Even though you're using it to ingest and make sense of web logs, we're not communicating any PII across the network. Um, Buskeville, yeah, is uh, also open source. And also I welcome you to take a look at it on GitHub and to try and deploy it. You can deploy it either as a SaaS service where you are the client sending us the vector features, or you can take the whole framework including the clearinghouse and try it out with yourself. We ship with the default model, not with the deflect model. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, on the right hand side, this is a GIF that obviously doesn't GIF inside a PDF. Um, but yeah, at the moment, basketball settings are a two minute sliding window. Uh, it can adapt to any web traffic. Every IP log entry generates a prediction. And uh, we don't allow the machine to make the final decision on whether an IP is representing a human or a bot. Um, anomalies above a particular threshold are then challenged uh, by the deflect system. Uh, we send a, basically a reverse shot challenge to the browser to prove that there is a browser behind this IP and it is not a bot. On Deflect, it is doing about 40 million lines uh, per day and over 35 behavioral features have been modeled already. Next slide. Yeah, you can see an attack basically in action where in the last 24 hours, 150,000 IPs uh, have breached the threshold. They were all challenged. And as you can see as well, you know, a thousand of those IPs had passed the challenge meaning it was a false positive. So again, I think we, we feel it's important not to let the machine make the final decision here on who's who in the network. And um, yeah, send the challenge to make sure. Next slide. From about a week ago, an example of what an attack looks like. Uh, this is a um, Ukrainian uh, media from uh, Zhytomyr, the town of Zhytomyr. Uh, three various attack types. 33 million malicious requests, quite a large botnet, over, over 100,000 bots. I mean, this is basically what the day-to-day -day on Deflect looks like. Because we work quite a lot with heavily targeted websites, you know, we, we really uh, are, I guess, a honeypot for a lot of the malicious activity happening on the internet today. Next slide. Right, so moving from the protection of uh, freedom of association and uh, on the internet, we feel that, you know, bringing down a website is another form of censorship. You know, you can block a user from accessing a particular resource or you can destroy that resource as well. Um, moving on actually from destroying that resource and the protection that Deflect offers, I wanna talk to you now about blocking the user from accessing particular resources or the internet in general, filtering, censorship, and network shutdowns that we're seeing more and more today. Next slide. I'm gonna focus here on the Ukrainian use case. I think it is very much a focus for my organization now. Uh, you can see here quite an old network map um, of Ukraine. Uh, with Crimea still connected to the Ukrainian network and the Donbass, the east of Ukraine. Uh, also connected to the Ukrainian network. Now that is not actually the case anymore. A lot of the occupied territories have been rerouted to the Runet, meaning to the Russian internet, meaning that people living in these temporarily occupied territories are part of the Russian internet now and therefore behind Russian network surveillance and Russian censorship. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about two types of internet shutdowns and what kind of solutions my organization is bringing to bear 
to challenge these kind of shutdowns. Um, the most prevalent of which um, that I call scenario one in this presentation, you know, and that we see quite a lot around the world, you know, from Russia to Belarus to Kazakhstan to Iran at the moment, you know, and to quite a lot of countries in Africa, so on and so forth, northern India, is the disconnection of popular internet services. You know, the internet by and large is very much dependent on a few companies now. And if you can block the IP space of these companies, of these cloud providers, you have virtually blocked uh, any usable internet uh, from the population. Usually when you implement a shutdown like this, you also want to target you know, VPN services uh, that people might use to uh, circumvent these blocks. Next slide. So as a solution for scenario one, we have devised the, the Sino browser. Sino is an abbreviation of censorship.no with the motto of share the web. And I'll explain why we share the web. Next slide. So Sino is trying to kind of change uh, or introduce a new generation of circumvention technology, which is not reliant on connecting to sort of a single hop proxy solution, whether it's VPN or something similar. We have actually built Sino uh, to use the BitTorrent protocol for routing and for distributed storage. Um, it is the first web browser of its kind, uh, which is actually using the BitTorrent network in order to fetch a particular resource, have it inserted into the BitTorrent DHT, and then delivered back to the user. The biggest difficulty was really in <laughs> rebuilding this web page and uses browser in order so that it shows, you know, in the same way as before, allowing for dynamic connectivity with, it, with the website as well. Next slide. Now, by virtue of using the BitTorrent protocol and by virtue of networks allowing incoming connections to a particular device, every user of Sino also becomes an active node. This means that we have as many nodes, as many proxies, if you like, as there are users. Now, this allows any person here in the UK, wherever it is that you live, that is possibly in a network not being censored, to become a routing node for somebody living in a network that is being censored. Your phone's connectivity is automatically registered inside the DHT, and people in Iran, people in Russia, people in other countries undergoing shutdowns, are able to connect to the rest of the network through you. This is particularly important because in the scenario number one of internet shutdowns, your IP is not part of a large corporate public IP space. Your IP is usually not included on the block lists of when internet shutdowns are being implemented. And all you need to do is install the app and have it open and running on your phone. This is what we call cooperative browsing inside Sino. Next slide. Now, also by virtue of um, using BitTorrent, we have the ability to do decentralized caching. Now, this is very interesting because what it means is that when you have opened a page which is censored in your particular network environment, the next person to open that page doesn't need to leave the network, the national network anymore. They can simply get it from your phone. And this has been, you know, a huge boon really for preserving the connectivity between IPs inside and outside the censored zone. Because frequently requested content is often important content, particularly during a shutdown, it, is only, need, it only needs to be imported into the network, you know, once or twice. And thereafter, thousands or millions of readers can access it without leaving the network anymore. This also allows us to continue content distribution among people inside the censored zone once the internet has been completely, external connectivity has been completely switched off. And I'll come back to talking a little bit more about this. Next slide. In shutdown scenario number two, total disconnection. So, sorry, not yet. Um, <laughs> so total disconnection means that either a cable connecting your particular network, village, town, maybe even city, 
or the various cables that connect you to the rest of the national network, which connects you to the rest of the global network, are no longer functioning. In the Ukrainian example, this is happening because of military activity, because of bombardments, you know. Regions are being disconnected from the rest of the Ukrainian internet and the rest of the global internet, of course, that by default. This means that no proxy is going to save you, you know. No clever method is going to get you out of the zone because there is no connectivity. This means that you'll never get to Facebook or WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever it is that you need to get to because that is located physically outside of a town or region. Next slide. So to, to deal with this problem, you know, we're using decentralized uh, protocols and services, really. I mean, um, this centralized internet is being pitched as number three at the moment. And really, I think it's, you know, number one. You know, the first internet plus, you know, internet 2.0 of social media, the centralized internet has equaled the decentralized internet, really. But I think it's a future that is actually revisiting the past. So... All we need to do in this case is actually bring the services, the servers, the protocols that people need to have in order to communicate with each other back into their geographic localities, back into their networks. It's not a very complicated idea, but we've just moved away from that so far uh, in the last 20 years or so. Um, I think now with the pushes behind Web3, uh, we are beginning to realize the opportunities that were lost and what we can regain once again by bringing either the servers closer to the users or getting rid of this notion altogether and considering that we are all, you know, can, we can all be service to each other. Obviously, email is an old example of this. As now, you know, in growing popularity is the matrix protocol, you know, a decentralized federated protocol. And decentralization is really key behind a lot of the technology that we're developing now for censorship resistance. Next slide. So once again, back to Ukraine. Uh, the project that we stood up uh, in early March after the second invasion began uh, was based really on collating and presenting um, a readable menu and a few user guides and to the Ukrainian population. We went and sourced machines with as many um, ISPs who actually still had hosting racks in their vicinity, in their locality. Um, at the moment, the DCOMS project is uh, in nine different regions of Ukraine, uh, also inside occupied territories. And uh, each of those servers basically presents ready to go uh, matrix chat rooms. Um, actually, next slide. Ready to go matrix chat rooms with the, the new sort of interface that the matrix team is developing element uh, that allows people to have a, either a web interface or an app interface in order to talk on matrix channels. There are public rooms uh, where hundreds, sometimes thousands of people are uh, using to communicate with each other. There are obviously private rooms where we don't know what is happening. Um, aside from metrics, we're also offering them the decentralized uh, micro blogging platform Mastodon. Uh, so in nine different locations, also with federation set up and working. Uh, we're offering each of the services also a Delta chat server. Delta chat is another messaging system that is actually using the SMTP protocol for communications with end-to-end -end encryption via PGP. And the Briar chatting system, uh, which uh, by default uses the Tor network as its primary communications protocol and fails over to Bluetooth mesh uh, device to device connectivity in the absence of any internet altogether. Now mesh connectivity, you know, is not necessarily an ideal solution for every use case, but when you consider that many people um, in Eastern Europe are living in large uh, blocks of flats or may find themselves, you know, inside a bomb shelter uh, or, you know, maybe even protesting or being outside in the street in a similar space, you know, mesh networking becomes uh, a very useful tool in the absence of any other communication options. Uh, and obviously, we are also um, offering offline downloads 
of some technology, including uh, the Sino browser. Next slide, please. Now, the Sino browser is underpinned by uh, what is essentially a core technology we have developed called WeNet. Um, so WeNet is the library that is doing all of the decentralized caching, content delivery, bringing requests to the edge of the network where um, web pages are being imported into the DHT, signed, distributed, delivered, so on and so forth. So WeNet is uh, available as an SDK for the Android platform and as an open source uh, library in, I think, C++, uh, which can really work with any type of traffic, you know, with instant messaging, with uh, email, so on and so forth. So Sino is the application layer sitting on top of WeNet, and WeNet is a library that you can be using inside your technologies for decentralized content distribution, authenticated content distribution. Next slide, please. So what we're trying to do now for networks experiencing disconnections um, is not have content imported to the network simply by user requests, uh, but actually um, preemptively going to crawl an entire web resource let's say it's Wikipedia, or let's say it's the Guardian news site or whatever, and preemptively injecting that into the network. So the WeCrawl tool, uh, also in collaboration with Web Recorder, uh, is now tasking itself with the uh, crawling, scraping, whatever you like, web resources that we believe are essential to people um, living inside a uh, censored network. And these web resources are then accessible to the user as the Guardian website is normally via the Sino browser. And, you know, even if there's no way to get to the Guardian, but we have injected all of their resources into the DHT, they can access it via the web browser using the normal URL as before. Next slide. Then we need a content uh, delivery mechanism. We need a transport, you know, to be able to bring this scrape packages into a disconnected network. So obviously these internet satellites and uh, you know, Elon Musk has ha had his heyday in, uh, in Ukraine until recently, until some of the latest outbursts uh, with the promotion proliferation of the Starlink system. Um, internet, uh, satellite internet is a solution in locations where it is accessible and where it doesn't present a greater danger to the users by virtue, you know, being quite easily geolocated. Um, another thing that we're doing is actually looking into placing data packets inside um, TV satellite streams, TV satellite broadcasts, uh, which are obviously one-way communications, but that is kind of all we need. So we can have a overt TV channel and a covert channel inside that uh, delivering data into a country where there are a lot of uh, TV satellite dishes. Next slide. So we're trying to piece all of this together now, basically figuring out which web resources are in demand, and hopefully we're not the ones really deciding all the time that we can have a way to crowdsource these requests, you know, which web resources people living inside a disconnected network want to have present on their network, then um, scraping those resources, turning them into web cache, delivering them inside the censored zone, and uh, using the WeNet infrastructure present on people's devices or people's computers um, to propagate it inside the censored zone thereafter. So basically, rebuilding pieces of the internet, pieces of a static internet by virtue of web cache uh, inside a censored zone. Next slide. And this is the penultimate slide uh, with a proposal for the protocol stuck right there at the end. 
Um, the ability for us, yeah, to use this Sino network as a means to propagate a web cache uh, is efficient because we only need a few injection points. You know, we don't need the entire population to have the injected content. You know, we only need a few people nodes to be able to receive it. Thereafter, it propagates peer to peer. At the moment, we are trying to come up with a sort of a multi-thronged approach to see how best to deliver this content and not settling maybe on a single channel of delivery, but weighing up the pros and cons of each different channel. And I think a goal for 2023 will be to decide what to do with a lot of the web cache that we already have by virtue of running the deflect network. And this is where the protocol pitch comes in. You know, deflect, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a web caching infrastructure as well. Reverse proxying, creating web cache, distributing it to, to users. A million people are generating cache on our network at the same time. Ideally, we would want to have this cache immediately available inside the WeNet network. It just makes sense. A, for us as a company running both infrastructures, disparate infrastructures, both of them dealing with web cache in various ways and for um, a similar goal, and that is content accessibility. Uh, we don't have a protocol that would allow us to take, you know, web cache generated by Nginx and put it into um, the BitTorrent DHT so that it is read in the same way, you know, on the Firefox browser. Uh, it is something we're beginning to actually uh, think about and hopefully present to you in the upcoming conferences of how we can have an interchangeable web caching standard. And the final slide, please. Um, since you'll have the PDFs of this, uh, you'll be able to come back through this presentation that I went through rather quickly. Here you have the links to the various projects that I mentioned. One I didn't mention, I'm just actually out of Kiev now, where we launched the Nidino platform, which is a national digital security helpline um, that is meant to serve the entire population with the most basic digital security questions. And we are working with the Global NOG Alliance uh, on the Keep Ukraine Connected program. Um, at the moment, you might have uh, seen on the news, uh, power is a huge electricity, power generation, power delivery, really, power distribution is a huge problem in Ukraine. And uh, many of the ISPs cannot serve their clients during uh, blackouts. Um, it all happened very suddenly, of course. Russia targeted electricity distribution centers. Um, and although Ukraine has the electricity needs, it cannot distribute it everywhere, including to these ISPs. They only had UPSs, you know, there as a normal ISP would, uh, which lasts for about an hour. So we're trying to import about eight tons uh, of batteries, um, lithium gel, Anything we can get our hands on, uh, the nearby region uh, has been kind of uh, stripped of batteries. And through the Global Nog Alliance, deliver uh, these batteries to various ISPs. So if you do have some time, is the QR code. Uh, check out the Global Nog Alliance, uh, cooperate with them, donate to them, and yeah, help us keep Ukraine connected. Thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. We, we certainly do have time for questions. Um, I think it's important. So I, there's somebody in the queue. Also a reminder to everyone to just join the queue if you can through the Meet Echo um, function. And yeah, go ahead, Carlin. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins with No Hats. Um, so I, I think this idea of the um, the Sino um, browser using uh, BitTorrent and the distributed protocols is interesting. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of personalized content in the internet. Um, do you have measures of how effective the web caching is given all this content? Because you know, clearly something personalized to me can't effectively be cached. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the internet really at the moment you know, isn't built to be cached and recreated somewhere else. So actually quite a lot of the, you know, the five years of trial and error that went into Sino 
was to build the uh, intelligence into the Sino client itself to figure out what to cache and what not to cache. Um, so any kind of cookie authenticated content uh, automatically is only transmitted to the requester and isn't cached in a DHT. Um, also, the user inside the settings has the options to switch on and switch off whether they want to cache this content and share it with others. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Uh, my other question was, um, you know, th this is obviously very effective at providing connectivity. Um, does it provide any form of uh, onion routing or um, sort of traffic analysis resistance? Um, by default, no, and we're very clear about that in our documentations that, you know, this isn't a network for anonymity, this isn't really even a network for privacy, it doesn't really add uh, too many, I mean, I think it kind of balances out the privacy properties it adds and the privacy properties it actually gets rid of. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're trying to be very clear that this is really a content delivery system for censorship circumvention, yeah. uh, having a content, uh, sharing your content with others, you know, allows you to see who's requesting that content from your device as well. Sure. So yeah, we're trying to be very clear in our documentations of its uh, advantages and disadvantages too, by not misrepresenting what it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. I think it would be interesting to explore to what extent uh, the, the peer to pin network could be used for onion routing style uh, um, you know, to, to try and provide some of this uh, resistance. Very much so. It's expensing so. the traffic around yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi there. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Uh, DKG, you're just a little soft. I'll raise my hand. Um, so thanks for the presentation, and, um, and thanks for the interesting work. Um, I had a question that was similar to uh, what Colin asked, which is, um, uh, so, so in addition to the sort of risks of targeting a distribution, I mean, we just heard um, about the you know risks to people for sharing specific content. Um, it, it seems like your devices can share the specific content through these uh, through something like Sino um, even more explicitly. This is your your device, right? Um, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how, um, uh, if, if there are uh, defenses there. Um, and then the other, uh, similarly with um, with sharing content, you know, it seems like this is a content distribution means of getting information into censored areas, but I, it's not clear to me how it gets information out of censored areas. Um, so somebody within a censored area might be interested in what people outside the censored area are saying, um, but uh, I don't. I don't know from the description. I didn't understand whether it was possible to also um, uh, get news out from within the firewall. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Thank you, DKG. Um, so yeah, on the kind of uh, guilt by connection or guilt by association front. I mean, what we've tried to do is make uh, DHT traversal um, very complicated, if not impossible, in the way that we're using uh, the particular BitTorrent protocols. Uh, so you can't crawl the DHT to figure out who is doing what. You can see people connected to the DHT. You cannot see the content that uh, they're requesting or sharing inside the DHT itself. Yes, you can be, you know, a malicious actor or let's say a law enforcement actor and download the legal content to see who connects to you in order to retrieve it. But then you're also guilty of downloading it as the people maybe unwillingly so connect to your device to get it from. Not a very strong defense, but nonetheless, I think that has some uh, legal footing to it in some instances. Um, all P2P efforts, I believe, you know, have this uh, chicken and egg problem. You know, we need a big haystack. And uh, until there are millions and millions of nodes and users and a lot of, you know, content of various uh, origin and uh, various interest in the network, um, these problems, you know, are, I think, a lot more serious and a lot more prevalent until then. 
when there is a huge amount of content inside the network of all sorts and types, I think the statistical probability that you're going to figure out a network of activists by downloading, you know, the Amnesty org page through Sino and then seeing who connects to you to share it uh, decreases. Um, how, how does, sorry, I, I want to understand how you how how Sino is thinking about the the authenticity questions as well, right? So you, your your description of one of the sure. legal defenses um, for say law enforcement seeing who connects to the Amnesty page, law enforcement can simply claim that they have the Amnesty page, right? Inject that claim into the DHT, and then. The law enforcement wouldn't themselves be retransmitting the amnesty page. They'd just be looking to see who comes crawling the DHT to think they have the amnesty page. Right? So they wouldn't actually be redistributing the content themselves. They're just doing a surveillance gathering or something like that. Right? Are there authenticity protections available? Um, um, how do I know look, I think, that I'm getting amnesty? I think... Um... I'll deflect <laughs> your question a little bit uh, for the interest of time. Um, I, I will just talk quickly about one type of authenticity that I think I am uh, qualified enough to discuss. Maybe we can go back to slide 23 just quickly. Uh, authenticity of content injected into the network and then delivered to the user happens through uh, content signatures which are made by injectors, as you see on the right-hand side of that diagram, uh, run by, well, in this case, equality, but anybody can stand up their own WeNet infrastructure. And if you want to serve you know, web content through it, run your own injectors. So injectors are signing the content. Uh, this content packet carries the signature throughout its lifecycle inside the DHT. Um, Signature validation is hard coded into the Sino client. Um, but maybe, yeah, on your other question of uh, authenticity inside the DHT, I'll, I'll just deflect it for, I think, lack of uh, ability to give you a concise or maybe even a correct answer. Um, but please uh, maybe post it as an issue in a sense, ship no uh, repo on GitHub and uh, We'll answer it there, if you don't mind. Uh, so uh, I have sort of a related question to Ted Lemon. Um, first of all, uh, there it seems like there are two ways that you could attack this in order to, by the way, this is really cool. I don't want to imply that this is bad. I'm just like thinking with my, how do we defend it hat on. Um, two ways to attack this, uh, one would be, it, is it possible for a bad actor to put bad data into the cache simply by deliberately providing enough instances that are producing that data that nobody else feels like they need to produce it? Is there a defense against that? Do you see what, I, uh, what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, the request for new data um, in the current Sino architecture comes from the user itself via mm -hmm. the URL. So the URL is a really key piece of addressing and routing in our system. Mm -hmm. um, this request is communicated to the injector. Injector IPs are also unfortunately for the time being hard coded into the client and if the injectors are not accessible because the sensor as well can get, you know, a copy of the Sino browser, then, you know, the entire network of other Sino users that have incoming connections become bridges to that injector. Now, as I just mentioned, the injectors are run by quality in this instance, and it is them who fetch content requested by the URL and then sign it before injecting it. Okay, um, so it's signed with your keys. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's, that seems like a good defense against that attack. The other uh, sort of obvious attack is if somebody manages to, to suborn your infrastructure so that they have access to your keys and potentially your infrastructure and can inject bad data that way. Have you, uh, what's your feeling about the, or what, you know, what are you, what's your thinking about that problem? Look, I mean, <laughs> also not a short answer. 
Yeah. Uh, also, we do understand that in this particular use case where people want to browse the web, because that's where the content is, we need to deliver the web. We need to have an interface between the web and the DHT, which is the injectors. The injectors are a point of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. We do do protect them using just you know internal um, company experience and you know um, best practices uh, to protect them. We do have a some experience because of the deflect project on how to do that. Um, but yeah, there are several points of vulnerabilities in the network. Mm. Uh, definitely not foolproof. Mm. And definitely, yeah, the more heads we can use to improve the system, the better. Cool. Yeah, so, I mean, it seems like there's an opportunity for, uh, you know, right now web, web uh, publishers don't generally, they, they do provide uh, authentication for web pages, but it's not provided with this particular use case in mind. No, that's and right. it would be interesting to see if there's a way to leverage that so that the burden is no longer on you to be, you know. That's correct. it. And I think this is where the web caching standard uh, could come in very handy. Yeah. Because, okay, if we are moving to web point three, we're going to need to deal with decentralized content and decentralized networks again. You know, we can't assume that there's going to be a tillless connection to Twitter all the time. Yep. And we don't want that actually in Web3. So we will need to figure out, you know, how to deal with, uh, you know, with a HTML kind of uh, uh, ecosystem and um, decentralized protocols, which I think, you know, it's not very difficult. We just need to actually come back to that yeah. space. Cool. Thanks so much. Thank you. Dimitri, thanks so much. Um, and thanks for the questions. I think they're really good. This is part of the reason why we really wanted to invite Dimitri here today, because they, I think, have a lot of real world use cases for this kind of um, hard problem. And um, it's not the first time it's been brought up in the ITF either. So hopefully we can continue that conversation. Um, but yeah, we're now going to shift to um, Corinne, who's giving the next talk. Um, Corinne, do you want to share the slides yourself since you're remote? Or I can, I can also pull them up and pass you the control, however you prefer. OK, let me do that. You should have control now. So go ahead. I'm not sure your audio is. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. No, no, no it's me. It's me. Welcome. Uh, Green, I think it's uh, muted. That was Sophia. Yeah, yeah, that's Sophia. <laughs> I think Corinne is muted. Corinne, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, you look like you're unmuted on, in Meet Echo, but maybe. Oh, no, she can't hear me. Either. Corinne? Okay, we're not able to hear you. No. Um, Uh, yep. So that we heard you for a moment. Mm. Let me try again. Uh, is this okay? Is, is video and audio coming through okay now? It's great. So let me get your great. slides back up and pass you the control. We're all Thank set. You. Go ahead. Wonderful. Welcome. Um, 
so hey all uh, i really appreciate the opportunity to to present some of my research work um today i'd really wanted to be in the room but unfortunately i had to leave somewhat early um so we're gonna do it like this um this might be a little bit repetitive for some of the people who were at my irtf talk uh on wednesday but i just want to make sure that everyone is at the same level um so I wrote both my master thesis and my PhD on the IETF. And what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the work um, in my research, which tracks what HRPC has been doing, uh, and then raise some critical questions as to like where we potentially could go next. Um, and as I said, for those who attended my ANRP talk, uh, the first slides will be familiar. But I do promise I will take a hard left at around slide uh, 10 or 9 and really focus on the human rights um, work. So there's really four sections. Uh, I'm going to talk again a little bit about being an anthropologist in the IETF, um, the work that HRPC has been doing since 2014, um, some of my findings in terms of the role that human rights have played in the IETF actually way before HRPC existed, and where we go next. Um, uh, just a bit of context. Hi, my name is Corinne. Uh, I'm an anthropologist of internet governance cultures. Um, I'm a research affiliate at the University of Cambridge. Um, some people might also know me in my role as the VP of research at the Open Tech Fund. Um, I'm not presenting here in that capacity. This is very much me uh, as the left academic. Um, some of the people might know me as the person who occasionally gets quoted um, when there are kerfuffles in the IETF about what appropriate behavior is. This is a key part of the research that I've done from my PhD. And if you want to read more about some of the problems that I've seen in the community, uh, you can find it on the link below in a piece aptly titled, What is wrong with loud men talking loudly? The IETF's culture wars. Now, um, I always find it easier when talks start off with sort of the one of the key main takeaways um, also as a bit of a provocation uh, to keep you engaged and for you to start thinking of the different ways in which you're going to argue that I am wrong. Um, so the main takeaway from this talk is a somewhat controversial one, at least for this community. Uh, and if there's one thing that I truly hope that sticks with you today, it is that the ITF is political inherently and that it always um, has done political and policy work to different degrees. Uh, and the question uh, then becomes is that has happened not just in, in explicitly um, political spaces like HRPC. Um, so what does that mean for, for this group's work going forward and what kind of an impact um, it would like to make? So um, I've been, involved in the HRPC work since its beginning, actually since before the group was, was founded. Um, and I just remember those early conversations really showing me how much of a fascinating um, place this community is for anthropologists like myself. Um, and to do that, I have to talk a little bit about anthropology as a field. Um, many people tend to think of anthropologists as social science researchers who go to like far away um, islands and um, study cultures of, of people who are very different from ourselves um, to sort of stu study the Argonauts of the Western Pacific to bring in some really classic anthropological work. And this for the longest time was the focus of anthropologists, um, but that is clearly no longer the case. Um, anthropologists at this point in time are, are everywhere. Uh, and especially since the 1970s, these, there's been this real critical shift in the fields where instead of um, often focusing on people who are less powerful than the anthropologist studying them. We focus on people who are more powerful. We call that um, lifting the gaze up at the most powerful in society. And we study our own societies and not just societies um, that are different from ours. And that means that we now also study um, well-known tech uh, companies. I mean, there are anthropologists in places like Facebook, Google, um, Twitter, Godspeed to them. Uh, but also in lesser well-known tech communities like the IETF. Um, so a bit of work about what we do as anthropologists. Now we study human behavior and cultures through a very distinct 
set of uh, methods and methodologies. So direct engagement with people um, that that collectively make these cultures by participating in their world. So in my case, to make this more concrete, for my PhD, I essentially spent three years doing field work within the IETF and the IRTF. Uh, and I did in the interviews, field work, as well as analyzing mailing lists and RFCs and a bunch of other documents produced by the ITF or around the ITF. And what this type of research really allows me to understand is the kind of cultural conditions um, that have shaped how protocols are made. And for this particular talk, um, I'm looking at like what HRPC has done within the ITF and the IRTF and, it's, and how to think about the kind of impact that the group has had. Um, which brings me to my talk today. Um, Human Rights Works in the ITF and IRTF, uh, where are we and where are we going? Now, some of you in the room might actually recognize the still on this slide from the Net of Rights movie that was made in 2015 by Nielsen Uver and Joanna Varon, uh, for which they interviewed various ITF engineers to explore the relationship between internet protocols and the promotion and protection of human rights. Um, now, it's really tempting to start a talk about the role of, of human rights uh, advocacy within the ITF by saying it all started in 2014 when the HRPC group um, was, was started and approved, uh, started by Nielsen Uver, Avri Doria, and Joanna Varon, uh, and approved by Lars. Uh, and I will certainly get back to that moment in time. But I do think as a researcher, it's also my role to say um, we need to trace the work on rights within the IETF beyond these more recent times. Um, because it doesn't, if we just start in 2014, I'm not doing justice to what essentially I see as the long arc of public interest technology advocacy that has occurred in the IETF. Um, so it would be possible to also start tracing debates within the IETF and IRTF about the impacts, uh, impact of protocols on a number of rights with the Snowden revelation. Um, that is another starting place. But there's also an argument to be made uh, that we can point at the publication of RFC uh, 6973 on privacy considerations, um, spearheaded by Alyssa Cooper and others in 2013 as a starting point of sort of rights conversations in the broader IETF. Or um, I could start even earlier with the participation of folks like John Morris in the IETF, who wrote one of the most sort of explicit IDs, uh, internet drafts about the policy implication of protocol works uh, in 2010. Or uh, if we follow the work of Professor Sandra Brahman, who has essentially done very uh, beautiful and comprehensive uh, studies of early RFCs, we can essentially trace policy, including human rights considerations, all the way back to the founding days um, of the IETF. So uh, I think I have sufficiently belabored the point that I'm trying to make, uh, which is that political questions, including debates about rights, have in one form or another always been part of the IETF's discussions. Um, for one, because technology in many ways is politics by other means, as various academics have convincingly shown, but more practically, I guess, um, because IETF engineers have always considered their technology also in the context of its deployment in the wider world, which inherently means about thinking about politics uh, in terms of like the kind of power relations um, and, and historically contingent um, structures that end up influencing how protocols get used. Now, this does raise an interesting question. Um, if human rights and policy considerations have always been part of the IETF, why has the work of the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Group been so contentious, um, upsetting so many people, especially in its, in its early days. Um, and to do this, I will now move back uh, to HRPC and give a bit of an overview of its um, trajectory. So um, as I mentioned in uh, October in 2014, um, three human rights advocates, Nielsen Uver, Avri Doria, and Joanna Varon, essentially came to uh, Lars Eckert, the IRTF chair at the time, with, with an interesting idea. 
um, they wanted to research how internet standards would impact human rights. Um, and related as part of that, they were interested in developing guidelines that ITF engineers could use to think through the potential impact of their, uh, of their documents, of their technologies on, uh, on rights. And the idea in their words was to preserve the internet as a human rights en enabling environment. Now, to achieve these goals, um, they set up the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group uh, in the IRTF. And then in 2017, the group published its, uh, its first RFC, RFC, RFC 8280, um, which uh, is entitled Research into Human Rights Protocol Considerations, and that outlines different questions that one can ask of a technology to understand how it might have broader implications for policy and rights. Now, after the publication of this human rights document, um, it has not it has not seen a lot of wide take up. So sometimes you do see people say we have a, a small human rights consideration section uh, in our document, but not very often. And on Wednesday, I talked a little bit about how that is um, in part due to the fact that um, there is some cultural hesitancy on the part of, of many in the IETF to explicitly talk about rights. Um, given that they worry about what kind of outside scrutiny that might invite or how it undermines how the ITF does work, which is not, um, because it's just not very comfortable with not human rights as such, but the different um, centralized institutions like the UN that are tied into the human rights legal framework. Um, that being said, the group has had um, has had influence and impact in, in very different ways. Um, their work, their presence is well cemented, uh, not just in the IRTF, but in the IETF. Um, a number of people who came into the IETF, uh, myself included, um, are now present in different ways. They are um, part of IETF leadership. They've set up other research groups. They participate in IETF working groups. Um, etc. And um, all of this to say that the HRPC group might not have had the kind of narrow impact it had initially set out for itself, namely getting ITF engineers to take on RFC 8280, but the existence of this group of people with an expertise at the intersection of standards and rights um, has had a really interesting impact on technology development in the ITF in a much broader way, in a, in a way that perhaps the folks who started it hadn't even um, imagined. Now, I want to get back to some of, of, of these more interesting and positive impacts of this community in a later slide. Um, but first, I want to sort of go back to some of the discussions we've had here uh, over the past years, and in particular, the one around politics. Um, there are multiple reasons why the HRPC work was so contentious. Um, part of it, obviously has to do with like the political, uh, the political economic reality of protocol development um, and deployment, which meant that adding human rights considerations to documents was seen as perhaps slowing things down, adding complexity, doing all these things when it wasn't clear like what the benefit would be necessarily. Um, likewise, you know, there were some issues around potential uh, mitigation strategies for human rights impact that were in tension with economic considerations of latency or efficiency. Um, a problem that is obviously well known to the IETF. Uh, we see it come up in, in other working groups as well. Um, but one of the, the concerns that I really want to foreground today is the cultural um, sort of conditions that shape the human rights discussions. And uh, the worry that exists amongst the many IETF engineers about making these, um, these impacts, these political aspects of their work more explicit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the concern being that if the ITF is more explicit about how its work is political, um, this might actually um, invite unwanted scrutiny and outside regulation. Um, there was also a worry that it would open them up to the demands of a number of actors, including governments, uh, who will want things that many in the ITF consider to be bad technical practices, like undermining or um, backdooring encryption schemes, for example. Um, and the, the problem is that, or the problem for the HPC group 
is that their demands um, of human rights were seen as being unwanted and impossible, um, even if maybe technically they weren't. Um, and so, for instance, one of my interviews, interviewees said, so, for example, I agree that it would be wrong for the ITF to start taking positions on economics. Saying that we need an anti-capitalist ITF will be kind of stupid, right? Um, it's never going to happen anyways. So for the credibility of the organization, for its sponsors, for the people here who make use of the technologies developed, it would make no sense to do overtly political things. Um, that being said, uh, following the Snowden revelations, sometimes the political moment trumps these worries and ITF engineers do take up polit political debates and translate them in technical ways. As for instance, we saw with RFC 7258, um, pervasive monitoring is an attack that came out after the Snowden revelations. Now, some of the folks who co-authored that might be in the room. I mean, obviously can't see if Stephen is there. And he and I have been having some conversation about the extent to which this was or was not overtly political. Um, but I would love to hear uh, uh, your thoughts on what made that moment uh, so unique uh, that it was possible to actually get this document uh, published, because I do see it as a political stance, even though it's couched in, in technical terms. Uh, and for those wondering about my choice of slide pictures here, I guess I was going for the message that sometimes politics are as run of the mill in the ITFs as are cookies. Now, uh, going back to HRPC, how do we think about its role in the ITF and the IRTF? Um, and if we look at the use of RFC 8280, um, it seems pretty minimal. But I do think that, no pun intended, uh, this would be too narrow a standard for judging the impact of the group. Uh, and in my PhD research, I outline uh, HRPC's influence in terms of um, its role as a landing pad for people who are interested in the intersection between politics and protocols. Um, as a bit of a, uh, a safe space for engineers who are looking to repoliticize uh, re protocols, uh, as a place where people can be mentored and grown, help to grow into different roles in the IETF, including in leadership, as a number of HRPC folks have done. Um, so in other words, how I have, have theorized the group is really as it having various bridging functions. Uh, functions. So bridging between new folks and people who, who have been here for a long time, um, between end users, especially from the majority world, whose views are not necessarily represented here, uh, and the sort of technical slash corporate interests that are well represented at the ITF, um, but also between activists who focus on systemic issues around racism and sexism, um, and those working in the ITF to make it more open and accessible, um, a bridge between the research in the IRTF and the technical work that happens in the IETF, a bridge between political and technical debates, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, where in the first couple of years, uh, many of the people who started in HRPC actually stayed within the narrow lane that they had carved for themselves in the IRTF. That is clearly no longer the case. Um, and that's also where some of the strength of the group really lies uh, in, in its way to provide a, a bridging function and a landing pad and a place for experimentation and contrarian views um, that, you know, that the ITF tends to say it, it really appreciates. Um, but more importantly, what I wanna drive home is the notion that the work that the HRPC has been doing is not necessarily um, exceptional um, or totally coloring outside of the ITF's boxes. Um, it really, I truly do see uh, HRPC as an extension um, of the long arc of public interest representation within the IETF, uh, but bringing in a new and wider set of concerns, uh, including is around uh, issues like environmentalism and racism, but also by connecting the kind of work that some people do in their day jobs to that is maybe not as technical in nature to discussions that are happening here. Um, quo vadis. Okay, quo vadis. A really fancy way of saying a Latin. Uh, where do we go next? Um, the biggest question that I see for HRPC is how it wants to keep repositioning itself within the ITF IRTF ecosystem. Um, there are obviously a number of different routes it could take, uh, including one in which it becomes a space uh, for broader consideration of, of politics and policy developments and how those impact the ITF. 
um, and, and uh, how to potentially respond to those. Um, now, there are plenty of thorny questions, I believe, that could benefit from the unique perspective, uh, perspective that this group can, can leverage together, um, whether it's on growing government repression and surveillance, um, or like the kind of examples that uh, Dima just brought by the work that Equality is doing, having those kind of voices have a space within the IRTF and IETF is, is incredibly important, and I feel the community values it as well. Um, it's not necessarily for me to say what the best way forward is, um, but I am very interested, as I know you are, in having that discussion. Um, so I think I will I will leave it at that and just thank you for being given the opportunity to present. Um, if you're interested in my research, there's a link below to the entirety of my uh, PhD thesis. Um, I wouldn't recommend reading the whole uh, 90,000 90, words, but maybe skimming a bit here and there if you're interested. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Corinne. Folks, feel free to get yourselves in the queue. I'm going to cut it, though, because we have to move on. Thanks. Thanks, Corinne. This is Elliot. Um, once again, congratulations on your ANRP award. It's very well deserved. Um, as somebody who's been participating in this group as an engineer from the beginning, with some amount of trepidation, and different points, a great amount of trepidation, I, I want to make two comments. Uh, the first is, um, I think a lot of us, especially uh, senior engineers, uh, struggle with this group, in, 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 and not just the group, but the concept of human rights, because at the end of the day, we find that there's no right answer for us, uh, that anything we do can be used for great harm uh, or great good. Um, and uh, so that brings me to... Uh, my second point, which is where to go from here. Um, the value, I think, of this group, to me at least, has not been in publications from the group, but rather in the presentations to the group, um, which I've learned a lot from, by the way. And uh, for that, I'd like to thank both the current chair, the previous chairs, and the pre presenters themselves. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is that we figure out a way, and I don't, I don't think we just means the HRPC, but we meaning the broader community, uh, to surface the presentations, perhaps the ones that are, uh, that, that maybe this group thinks are most important, um, to the broader community, um, with, uh, maybe some suggestions about the ramifications to, uh, uh, the IETF. I'm not quite sure how to do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there just to say it's an inkling of an idea and I, I think maybe, uh, maybe the group can pick it up or, or, or not. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, thank you, Elliot. Uh, I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, I, um, I think I, you know, thank, thank you for the talk, Karen. Uh, I, I agree very much with uh, uh, your your points. I think HRPC has had a, a pretty wide impact in the IETF and, and the IRTF. Um, and I, I, I agree, I think, also that it's not so much with the documents. Uh, it's with bringing the people in. It's, bring, it's with be explicitly bringing in people with different viewpoints uh, and bringing them to the ITF community and exposing the community to those viewpoints. Um, I think this is a very good thing. We need, we need this diversity of views. Um, we are nowhere near diverse enough in the ITF and the IRTF. And the, the more we can do, and HRPC does that in one small way and in one axis of uh, diversity. Uh, and I think that's a great thing. And I think if we could try and bring in more people from other axes of diversity, I think that would be a, a a very beneficial thing for the organization. Um, even if there would be growing pains with the different viewpoints uh, and the, the different clashes of, of view. So I hope we can continue to do that. Um, 
I also strongly agree that we have uh, always discussed politics in the ITF. Um, one of the examples I, I thought you were going to bring up but didn't is RFC 1984, for example, which was a, a very political document and one which very explicitly discussed economics from back in 1996. Um, I think what's changed now is that we're finally starting to admit that we're discussing politics. And I think that's a very good thing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Corinne. This is uh, Adrian Farrell. Um, yeah, I, I, I rarely manage to get to these physical meetings because there's this sort of agenda going on where, where people are having other working groups. Um, and I think that's part of the issue. So when I work on a protocol document, I know I need to have security considerations, but I also know that I don't know much about security. And um, the IETF helps me with that by providing a core of people I can go and consult. Um, what I think we're missing, and it's probably the next step, is to try to get a human rights directorate. I don't like the word directorate in this sense, but in a review team, maybe, who cannot tell me what I'm getting wrong in my protocol and what I must do, but can ask me the questions. So when I look at the guidance RFC, I, I get to about page three and I've glazed over because I've got protocol work to develop. I need somebody who can help me bridge the gap um, from my protocol to what should I be thinking about. And possibly by the time I'm writing a detailed protocol spec in the depth of a working group, it's too late. What we need is a kind of up level, uh, almost like a working, review the working groups, not review the protocols. Niels, you should be able to come on, Mike, if you want. I, I closed the queue, but I'm I'm happy if you want to jump in. We can't hear you though. No. I can see you talking. Hear? There you are. Yep. You Bye. Hear you hear me? No. Uh, thank you for the question, Niels. I, I do not have a good academic citation for landing pad. I actually try in these talks to stay away from academic, academic lingo as much as I can because I don't necessarily find it super helpful. Um, but I think the question in that sense has answered itself because um, three of the people who just took the time to listen to my talk and come up with really uh, interesting and considerate responses to it we're all people who have been at the IETF for, for a long period of time and who all self-identified as engineers. So it's definitely a, a two-way street. Uh, and I think again, like the, the point that Colin made that like one of, the, one of the strengths of this group is that it brings together people um, and that those people are also taken serious uh, is, is really key um, beyond or in addition to all of the different documents that, that the group is producing. So I, I put myself in the queue um, to kind of come back in on some of the suggestions and to thank folks for making them. And also to thank you, Corinne, because you've created the space and the discussion that really is self-reflective and helps us, I think, as a, as a research group grow and get better. So some of the suggestions to make that work more visible, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think we need to think about that. Um, as well, the idea of a directorate, I mean, it has been tried, as somebody also mentioned in the chat, um, 
There wasn't always, it wasn't always well received, but I do think your iteration on the model, Adrian, was useful and that it's not about telling people what they've got wrong. Um, although that is what directorates in the ITF usually do, right? I mean, from a security perspective or whatever, that is the, you know, what they're set up to do. I think it is more of a come along and let's try to work out some of these trade-offs or actually even expose that there is maybe a trade-off. So um, I think that point is well taken. I would also say um, that's what maybe the guidelines draft is meant to do as well is to sort of document that, write it down, make people aware that that work can be done and then come to HRPC for um, that expertise. So that all explicit goals, I agree we could all be doing a better job. So um, I think we ought to move on because actually we have, uh, we have to update on drafts and, and a few um, pieces of AOB, including, um, which we probably won't get to, um, a request to maybe recharter slightly. So Corinne, let's thank her one more time, congratulate her for her award. Thanks for coming. We wish you could have been here in person. All right, um, okay, so let me get back to my slides. Okay, well the current work we have, so I'll have um, folks who are working on any of the current work, go ahead and throw yourselves in the queue. We'll go sort of rapid fire update. Um, but the first one is on guidelines. So this is under IRSG review, if I'm not wrong, Gershabad, I don't know if you have anything to add on mic about this. Yeah, go for it. It would be good to just hear where that's at. Hello, Gershabad. Um, yeah, uh, the guidelines draft, if, if you don't already know about it, is an update to 8280. It um, condenses guidelines for people trying to gauge the impact of the protocols they're designing on human rights. It's a set of guidelines. This document is under IRSG review. We received two reviews from Jane Coffin and uh, Brian Trammell. And we this week, all of the comments have been addressed. Um, so yeah, uh, just uh, I'm hopefully the draft will proceed after that. But um, yeah, the I, I sent a summary of the changes on the mailing list. Um, yesterday just some reordering of the sections nothing uh, major yet so thank you thank you for that yeah so you have uh really appreciate that update and it's also in the data tracker good cool check 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 um yep go ahead nick on freedom of association. So this is, um, I'm a co-author on that. So we've got Nick as Doc Shepard um, and also Neil. So yeah, feel free to give us an update, please. Yeah, just a very brief update. Um, last um, IETF, we talked about uh, making some edits at, at Niels did that, and I have just finished another um, round of review, and I have an open pull request with some edits there. Um, I think we've addressed the sort of confusion about considering the same protocol on different issues. I think that's um, sort of clearer to read now. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that after those minor edits, we could go back to the research group for our last call and, and progress from there. So uh, no, no big changes, but I do think there have been some um, improved edits and, and hopefully we can make it even more readable. So if I'm hearing you right, Nick, there will be, you're, you're requesting a few um, additional changes and then we can progress, is that right? That's right. Great, thanks for that. Niels, I don't know if you wanted to respond, but I'm going to, as a co-author with my hat on, I'll need to look over what those are in terms of what timeline I think that will take. Okay, great. Neil says, thanks. We'll work on it. All right. So we do have one more um, piece of work that I would, um, didn't put on this slide, but is in our agenda. So apologies to Sophia for that. Sophia, come on the um, mic, and I know you have slides as well. You can, um, you can go ahead and share those, or I can share them and pass you, but... I think I got it. <laughs> 
All right, yes. go ahead and tell us all about it because I've not got on the slides. There you are, perfect. There you go. Uh, so, hey, everybody. Um, we also wanted to talk a little bit about upcoming work that is happening right now. This is not an official draft, but there's some work that has been happening over at GitHub. So it's just kind of a call of actions of a call for action on if you want to be part of this effort as well, so you can involve yourself on it. Or if you have any other ideas of what should be part of this work, you can give us also that feedback. So this is a draft that we have been putting together that was born from the last IETF, IETF 114. We had an invited from CETA, um, Lana Ramic, who gave a presentation about uh, how digital tools and different protocols and different technology is used to enhance intimate partner violence. And in this case, we think about intimate partner violence of any kind of violence that is executed with a partner, but also someone you have an intimate relationship with. It could be a caregiver, it could be your parent, it could be someone else. It doesn't have to be always a romantic or sexual relationships. Um, so basically, we, because of that presentation, we decided to create a document that tries to provide the standards with recommendations that, that if they are put in certain kind of protocols or systems or any kind of technology that they are describing, what kind of implications could that technology have in to enhance abuse in the cases of domestic abuse or more broadly in the case of intimate partner violence? So we put together already a kind of a structure of a draft. There's already some definitions of, for example, what is technology-based intimate partner violence? What kind of attacks exist in this place? Um, the specific abuse technology that happens in these cases some recommendations to protocol designers, and we also added security recommendations in case um, there's some from security that has to be taken into account. So if you are very interested in this work, uh, please join us in the GitHub or in the mailing list. If you think this all sounds reasonable and this structure sounds reasonable, also let us know. If you want anything else also to be added, let us know. And if you want to participate actively in this draft, also let us know. Um, yep. Yeah. Just without a quick update on that. Thank you. Because this is new work, I do actually want to open the queue or invite folks to get into the open queue um, for any questions about this. Um, for folks maybe who didn't come or didn't watch the um, 114 session, you should. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, and so it's really wonderful to see. It's really wonderful when we have speakers come and then those speakers inspire work. That's actually the ideal case. It doesn't always happen, that's all right, but go ahead, Colin. Good to see you in the queue. Hi. Uh, so just one qu question for clarification first. Uh, this draft has not yet been submitted, right? It's in progress. No, it's a still in progress. Um, we do okay. have the first initial structure and some text, and potentially in the next week we can submit, but it's not yet in the data tracker. Yeah, OK, great, thanks. All right, awesome. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, thanks so much. So we have, oh yeah, go ahead, Colin. Uh, I'll come back. I was expecting more people to comment on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Colin Perkins, uh, I think this is a, a really important topic. Um, obviously, I, I haven't read the draft since it's not yet been submitted, but uh, uh, I, I would certainly encourage work in this space. I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you, Colin. Um, so on, I'm not going to pull up the chair slides again, but on our agenda, we have a short amount of time for um, cross-pollination from another working group in the IETF. Um, Adrian, if you're here, you've put yourself in the AOB on um, GNAP. Oh, good. You're remote. Wonderful. So you can also load your slides, or I can load them and pass them to you, whichever you prefer. Uh, I can. Uh, you can hear me, right? Um, yes, we can. I can do the slides. Fantastic. Um, can you see them? Not yet, but sometimes it takes a minute. Oh, wait, I have a, that, uh, they, it's fine if you want to share your screen, but it might also be faster if you just share the slide. I don't know if that's... I tried. Uh, okay, let me... Uh, 
you can uh, do the slides because uh, Chrome is asking me to change permissions, et cetera. Yep. Happy to. Okay, uh, so I, um, so, um, I'll, you can go to, uh, uh, so yes, uh, I'm involved in the GANAP uh, Grant Negotiation Authorization Protocol, uh, which is a successor to OAuth. Uh, the editors uh, were, uh, you know, uh, editors and principals in uh, much of the OAuth and UMA uh, protocol work. Um, this slide, uh, and I'm going to go pretty quickly because I wanted very interested in feedback from the group. Uh, so there's only uh, uh, five slides, but uh, uh, anyway, so uh, this gets uh, an authorization protocol has privacy uh, issues, of course, uh, that are significant in the next slide. I'll talk about that. But I am trying to, and I've been invited to introduce a human rights consideration into the, uh, into the document for GNAP, um, where uh, the issue, the difference from privacy is that it doesn't uh, consider delegation. It ignores the power asymmetry of the participants in the uh, protocol. And uh, the HRPC forced association uh, perspective is directly applicable here. So um, what I'm trying to do is convince uh, the uh, work group, the GANAP work group, that uh, unrestricted delegation to the authorization, uh, uh, unrestricted AS uh, selection by the subject, by the resource owner should be a must or should. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, just uh, a quick review about what GANAP is about. Uh, it specifies an authorization server that processes requests from a requesting party uh, and provides, uh, it's a token factory, what they call, and provides access tokens, authorizations to access a resource server. Uh, this is a list of the uh, privacy interests uh, that all meet at the authorization server. And in particular, uh, what I'm concerned about here is to avoid uh, lock-in uh, to the resource server uh, business, uh, to avoid the ability uh, to have policy surveillance. Uh, the resource owner's policy should stay uh, either entirely to themselves or to a... Uh, surrogate, a delegate that they choose, and to avoid uh, the opportunity for traffic analysis uh, by the uh, uh, by an authorization server uh, processing request that uh, where that authorization server wasn't uh, selected by the resource owner. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, I, uh, the last IETF, uh, I was asked to provide a PR. Uh, there's a bunch of discussion after that. Uh, it's a human rights considerations PR. Uh, I proposed three mitigations, uh, but the issue is uh, technically all three of them uh, are possible. Uh, the issue is whether these must be uh, the human rights issue, as I frame it, whether it should be a must or should rather than voluntary. Uh, next slide, please. The last one. So uh, the call to action uh, for HRPC and GNAP is uh, as, uh, what you see on this slide. Uh, first of all, I'm not familiar with uh, a lot of uh, any much of the work in IETF, but it seems to me like GNAP is the best example for the concerns that are being discussed in HRPC uh, at this time. And I'm curious if there are any other examples that might be considered as good uh, in recent memory. Um, yesterday at this time, there was a discussion, uh, which there's a link directly to about 15 minutes worth or 20 minutes worth of discussion in the GANAP work group. Uh, what's interesting here is that uh, the various commenters and editors and chairs uh, as individuals, not necessarily uh, officially, 
basically pointed out that uh, uh, agreed that hyperscale platforms uh, are an unintended consequence of the way OAuth uh, links the authorization server and the resource server. Uh, the uh, discussion of the fact that regulatory capture is a risk, and uh, I think people in this audience understand uh, all about that. And um, they mention uh, how GNAP is intended to work with these standardized verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers that are coming out of uh, 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 W3C and the Linux Foundation as data models. But standardizing these uh, data models uh, has a huge potential for mass surveillance. Um, uh, now that uh, didn't exist before with uh, less standardized or, of course, analog physical uh, credentials. So uh, my claim is that uh, forced association with hyperscale platforms is not, not no longer an unintended consequence as it was with uh, OAuth. Uh, and uh, therefore, it has to be dealt with uh, in GNAP by uh, making... Uh, AS delegation a must or a should. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing this work in to HRPC. I know that um, GNAP or GNAP met yesterday, and I don't know if there was also a parallel discussion in the working group about uh, this issue. I, I myself was unable to go because I had a conflict. Can you just give us an indication of how that conversation went yesterday or whether it did? Uh, well, I can do better than that. One of the editors, uh, Fabian, uh, has agreed to, and he's on the queue. So thank you. I, yes. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks for this, Adrian. It's a very interesting work. Uh, just to say that I'm one of the creditors of PNAP. Uh, we are taking this work very seriously. Um, it's just as was discussed earlier in one of your previous uh, comments. Uh, we are quite aware that we need to do security analysis. We, we also need to do privacy analysis and we are putting uh, measures in place. And for us, it's, it's kind of something that's new for us to actually um, uh, put, put measures in place against uh, um, human rights uh, consequences. So that's at least something where I think we would need some, some additional support. And I think that's kind of the message from Adrian, and we, we'd like to thank him for that. And yesterday it was it was discussed in the group, and actually it was one of the main points where a debate was, was quite open. Um, the main problem we have is, is really to find actual technical ways to, to do that in, in, in practice. And so that's what we're working on. So thank you very much. Thanks for that overview. I suggest because we've run out of time that um, you engage both in the HRPC list in asking for folks from this group to potentially engage in GNAP um, directly and um, talk about that there. Although, because this is maybe a cross research group, cross working group topic, um, I would encourage folks to try to CC both lists um, as the conversation progresses. But I don't think we can get into it too much more now although I will wait just a moment in case there are folks in the room um, who've not yet signaled they want to be in the queue. All right, again, uh, thanks. Yeah, Colin, please, always. It's Friday, I didn't move that quickly. Um, uh, Colin Perkins, uh, so I, I, I know absolutely nothing about GNAP other than reading the draft abstract in the last sort of 30 seconds or so. Um, from what you've been saying, there's clearly things that, that are worth discussing with this group. Um, I think one of the challenges is perhaps going to be uh, connecting the two sets of people with very, very different uh, expertise. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, you know, as Mallory says, posting to the lists is, is a good way forward. It, it may also be useful to make some uh, direct connections and set up some small groups to discuss uh, to, to avoid the two the two sets of people with such different backgrounds talking past each other. So just a plea on the mic and to the group, if you are interested in this, you've engaged in HRPC, you're familiar with um, reviewing documents, if you can just indicate to me 
um, at some point, or Colin even, that you want to engage in this, be really grateful for your help. And thanks again to the folks uh, who brought this, both Adrian and Fabian, for coming on mic. Um, I will just, <laughs> so just to stop this particular discussion and hop very quickly to the last um, of my slides. There's been some suggestions, um, also coming from me, frankly, that um, perhaps we could consider a slight recharter. I will also note that we, um, the, re the research group was recently reviewed by the IAB, and um, that's a process that happens occasionally. And I, I myself have gone through two, um, two of those um, reviews. And it's just maybe a good time to reflect. So I've had, some, I've had some of my own thoughts on what a recharter might look like. I was hoping to go through them with you in this meeting, but there's not really much time. So again, like would just say, maybe this is, a, this is definitely a conversation we'll take to the list. Um, and we'll welcome your feedback in that list discussion. We can also maybe make sure to allocate more time to this at the 116 meeting in Yokohama, since you're not able to totally read it right now, of course, I understand. Um, but I think the goal would just be to take on some of the feedback that was delivered here today, even about our ability to do um, reviews, um, bring others along into this work, mainstream it a bit more in the rest of the community, and also be able to take on a bit maybe what more we're thinking in terms of policy discussions, because it's not a word that we typically use, or it's not even present in the charter as currently, but certainly something that we in fact are, um, are doing. So to, to make that and expose that, make it more explicit and expose that, um, I think might be actually be a useful exercise. Those are just my personal thoughts as the chair, um, but Sophia and I will do our best to facilitate a conversation on the list and then at the next meeting. So I apologize that we ran out of time. I really wanna appreciate our speakers. I think it was worthwhile taking the time to hear them all out. Um, and especially just to take us back to the beginning, I think it was really useful to have uh, Tara talk about Allah's situation uh, because you can turn on CNN and see it in the cycle. Um, and it's just knowing that there is actually a touchstone in our community to Allah and his case, and it's not just an abstract human rights abuse case, um, I hope has moved you as much as it um, has been moving me to read about the situation. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> We're going to close now. Thank you.